And then the worst snake of all is malevolence. And that's, I think that's technically correct, because one of the things that you view, for example, when you're looking at post-traumatic stress disorder, is that it's almost always the case that someone who suffers from post-traumatic stress disorder, which you might think of as a real, real life reincarnation of the fall, is that people encounter something malevolent and it breaks them. Because it's the worst thing to understand. It's like suffering is one thing, man. That's, that's bad enough. Vulnerability and suffering, that's bad enough. But to encounter someone who wishes that upon you and will work to bring it about, that's a whole different category of horrible. Especially when it also reflects something back to you about yourself. Because if someone else can do that to you, and they're human, that means that you partake of the same essence. Strangely enough, that's actually the cure to some degree to post-traumatic stress disorder. Is that, like if you've been victimized, you're naive and you've been victimized. The way out of that is to no longer be naive and to no longer be victimized. And that means that you, you see this reflected in the Harry Potter idea, for example, that the reason that Harry Potter can withstand Voldemort is because he's got a piece of him. Right? He's been touched by it. And the way that you, the way that you keep the psychopaths at bay is to develop the inner psychopath so that you know one when you see one, right? And then, but that's a voluntary thing. It's, it's, it's so it's like a it's like a, a set of tools that you have at your disposal, which is full knowledge of evil, and that does. Nietzsche said, if you look into an abyss for too long, you risk having the abyss gaze back into you, right? The idea is that if you look at something monstrous, you have a tendency to turn into a monster. And people are often very afraid of looking at monstrous things exactly for that reason. And then the question is, well, should you turn into a monster? And the answer to that is, yes, you should. But you should do it voluntarily and not accidentally. And you should do it with the good in mind, rather than falling prey to it by possession, essentially, because that's the alternative. Now, how does it possess you? That's easy. Your suffering makes you bitter. Your bitterness makes you resentful. Your resentment means, makes you vengeful. And once you're on that road, you go down that a little bit farther, man. Well, you end up fantasizing in your basement about shooting up the local high school and then killing yourself, right? Because that's sort of the ultimate end of that line of pathological reasoning. Being should be eradicated because of its intrinsic evil, and I'm exactly the person to do it. And I'll cap it off with an indication of my own lack of worth just to hammer the point home, right? And if I can garner a little post, post posthumous fame along the way, well, that'll satisfy my primordial primate dominance hierarchy. Uh, imaginings too, at least in fantasy. So, you know, it's the full package if you want to go down that route. And Of course, people don't like to think about that sort of thing, and it's no bloody wonder, but w without the capability for mayhem, you're a, you're, you're, a, you're a potential victim to mayhem. So you need your sword, it should be sheathed, but you need to have it. And it's very frequently the case, if you treat someone with post-traumatic stress disorder, the, there's two things you have to do. You have to help them develop a very articulated philosophy of evil. Because otherwise their brain bothers them over and over and over. Why were you so naive? How did you become victimized? Why were you such a sucker? These are good questions. You don't want to have that happen to you again. You don't want to be exploited twice. Okay, so your eyes have to open up. We know the price of that from the Egyptian myth, right? You come into contact with Seth. What happens? Even if you're a god, you lose an eye. It's no joke, man. It's no joke, and then the cure for that is the movement down into the underworld and re the revitalization of the father. That's the identification with the force that created culture, right? And that then there's you and that together. Then you can withstand malevolence. Maybe you can withstand tragedy and malevolence. And then that's the whole secret, right? Because that's what you want in life. You need to be able to withstand tragedy, and you need to be able to withstand malevolence. Because those are the forces that are always working against you. And so it's a, this is associated with the I, Jungian idea of incorporation of the shadow, right? You have to be, we know this, God. We know how predators work with regards to children even. If you're a pedophilic predator and you're looking at a landscape of children, the child that you're going to go after is the one that's timid and won't fight back. You pick your victim. And predatory people in general are exactly like that, man. They're, because they're predators, they're not going to attack someone who's, who's going to fight back. In fact, the issue is likely not to even come up. They're going to be looking for someone, one way or another, that cannot conceptualize what they are. And then, perfect. It's, a, it's an open season, man. It's open season.
And so if you're treating someone with post-traumatic stress disorder, first they need an introduction to the philosophy of malevolence, and second they have to learn to become dangerous. Because that's the only way out. What's the alternative? They get these recurrent thoughts about their vulnerability in the face of malevolence, and their own naivety, because by definition, if someone psychopathic has exploited you, you're too naive. It's, it's a definitional issue. You can say, well, that's no fault of mine. How the hell could I be prepared? Fair enough, man. A perfectly reasonable objection doesn't solve your problem. Because it's an, it's an eternal problem.